I'm Frank Gifford. The ways of a wise schoolmaster are wise indeed, and a treasure to behold. Often it's what the man up front has to say in his teaching that determines how good his pupils will be. A coach is, of course, a schoolmaster. And in Cleveland, the Browns have a record that seems to say their coach is a teacher wise in the ways of football. In the last three years, the Browns have been world champions and runner-up for the championship, plus a second-place tie to their credit. The fact that the huge municipal stadium on Cleveland's lakefront rarely has an empty among its 84,000 seats is testament enough to the quality of the football the Browns put on display. The insiders call it a sound game. The fans call it exciting. The film record of their 1966 heroics shows both sides of the football coin. That's it, they said last summer. Jim Brown is gone. Cleveland's running attack will collapse, and without a ground attack, the passing game will die. How do you replace a Jim Brown? Apparently, the way to do it is to get a Leroy Kelly, number 44, and try a little harder. Jim Brown was gone, but last fall, the Browns led the league in rushing just the same. Leroy Kelly became the 12th player in the 47-year history of the NFL to gain more than 1,000 yards rushing in a single season. As for passing, quarterback Frank Ryan led the league in touchdown passes and set four new team records. The fact of the matter is, Cleveland just has a lot of good ball players, composed, determined athletes, dedicated to victory. Under the direction of coach Blanton Collier, these men won nine of 14 games and tied for second place in the East. The opening game against the Redskins keynoted the season, a season of united effort and team balance. With the Redskins ahead by 14 points, Linebacker John Brewer, number 83, intercepted a Sonny Jurgensen pass and bought the Browns the field position they needed to send Leroy Kelly on a 29-yard scoring sprint. Paul Warfield, healthy again after injuries had sidelined him for most of 1965, grabbed a Ryan aerial and dodged to the Redskin 40. Several plays later, Ryan passed to Gary Collins. The play covered 35 yards, and the score was tied. An interception by free safety Ross Fietner provided the impetus for the go-ahead touchdown. Field battery opened the final period with a touchdown, and the Browns had a 10-point edge. The Cleveland defense underlined its mastery of the Redskins when cornerback Erich Barnes stole another Jurgensen aerial and raced to the one-yard line. Ernie Green scored easily. The Cleveland air attack accounted for the final touchdown of the game. 
a game and a victory typical of the Browns in 1966. A solid ground game, a bruising alert defense, and an explosive passing attack combined to make the Cleveland Browns the most balanced team in football. The Cleveland ground game is a bread and butter football machine utilizing simple plays executed with maximum precision. Swift backs run hard behind the pattern thrust of a big line. They do not come in ones or twos. They come in waves. Assault crews of blockers. Bernie Green is one reason why the Browns gain more yards rushing than any other team in the NFL. He's a dependable, punishing runner with an appetite for contact. A trail of flattened tacklers is his trademark. pro football a lesson. You don't need a big fullback to have a strong running attack. Something you do need, however, is an experienced offensive line, anchored by powerful tackles like Monty Clark and team captain Dick Shafrath. Cleveland's guards are well-schooled precision blockers. Gene Hickerson, number 66, seals off the defensive tackle while John Wooten, number 60, traps the defensive end. The linemen. These are the men who decide the outcome of every play. But here is a man who can decide the outcome of an entire game, Leroy Kelly. For two years, the only ball carrying Kelly did for Cleveland was returning kicks. Then, Jim Brown retired. Leroy took his place and became a star. On his own or behind the screen of blockers, Kelly offers the defense the ultimate challenge. His flashing cleats wore a touchdown groove on Municipal Stadium's turf. He scored more touchdowns rushing than anyone else in the league. He averaged five and a half yards per carry, and only Gail Sayers gained more yards. He has a fluid move for every situation. float and glide past a nest of tacklers or blast his way yard by yard through a defense massed to stop him. Leroy is what's happening in Cleveland, Ohio. These are the men of the defense. Destruction is their game. The tackle, their chief weapon.
massive Jim Kinnicky, number 69, epitomizes the raw power which lies at the heart of the Cleveland defense. His fierce rush frequently commands the attention of three blockers, and sometimes even that isn't enough. To ball carriers, he's an iron-handed headhunter who makes each tackle a frightening experience. Cleveland's other defensive tackle, Walter Johnson, number 71, spins quarterbacks like toy tops. The defensive ends are veterans. Paul Wigan, number 84, is tough against the run, while the next snapping tackles of Bill Glass, number 80, are a passer's nightmare. Middle linebacker and tenure veteran Vince Costello is usually in the center of trouble. When he blitzes, it's always a direct hit. Where Costello is not, all pro corner linebacker Jim Houston is. Houston's moves against the run are instinctive, and he is rarely faked out of position. tight end Johnny Brewer switched to linebacker last fall and made the changeover so smoothly that he was named to the Pro Bowl squad. Football fans everywhere are familiar with the savage tackling of cornerback Erich Barnes. If number 40 is playing against you, he's the number one villain. If he's on your side, it's wonderful. is the inspirational leader of his secondary which led the NFL in pass interceptions. In a season highlighted by fine defense, no one enjoyed the spotlight's glow more than Mike Howell. His eight interceptions ranked him among the league's top defenders. Kellerman, number 24, came up from the taxi squad to start the last 11 games and performed in fine style. Ross Feetner settled at free safety this season to wheel and steal. He's the man who gets the Browns the ball when they most desperately need it. One receiver Feetner doesn't have to worry about is Gary Collins, the Browns' tall and talented flanker. Collins is a man with a variety of skills and a victory instinct. He will outfox and outmaneuver almost any defender. Or, if he's so inclined, he'll run right over his man to get into the clear. Collins has size, strength, and savvy. He puts them all together to be a winner. football's most dangerous receiver inside the 20-yard line. 
and in 1966, only Bob Hayes caught more touchdown passes than Gary. In the second game of the season, the Browns met the world champion Green Bay Packers. A pair of field goals by Lou Groza and two touchdowns by Gary Collins pushed the Browns into a six-point lead late in the game. But it all boiled down to Bart Starr on fourth down, looking the clock in the teeth, trying to pull out one last score. Jim Taylor grabbed a flat pass, eluded two Browns, and crashed into the end zone for the game-winning touchdown. But the Browns gained momentum after this narrow defeat and went on to register victories over every team in the Eastern Division. Ernie Green triggered them to a solid victory over the Philadelphia Eagles, but he slammed up the middle for the game's first score. In the third quarter, Frank Ryan laid a perfect strike in the hands of rookie tight end Milt Morin, and Cleveland led by 14. King Hill punted to open the final period. Three Eagles were cut down with a single block, and Leroy Kelly returned the kick 52 yards. Frank Ryan served up a final touchdown to Paul Warfield, and the Browns buried the Eagles 27 to 7. When the undefeated Dallas Cowboys came to Municipal Stadium, the weather was perfect, and so were the Browns. Early in the first period, Gary Collins blew right past Cornell Green and gathered in a Ryan Ariel for a 49-yard gain. Milk Morin pulled down another pass. This one for a touchdown and the lead. But it was the Browns' defense which established the pattern of victory. The front four smothered the passing game and shut down the run. The Cleveland zone pass defense took away the big boom of the Dallas attack. The long throw to Bob Hayes. Quarterback Don Meredith was intercepted four times trying to hit receivers in the seams of the Cleveland zone. Lou Groza, football's oldest toe, added two field goals to reinforce the Browns' advantage. In the third quarter, Ryan engineered a touchdown march that culminated in a two-yard scoring plunge by Leroy Kelly. An interception by Mike Howell produced the momentum for Cleveland's final offensive. Ryan connected with Paul Warfield on a post pattern, and a mighty Dallas team was unbeaten no longer. But in the return match on Thanksgiving Day, the Cowboys were at their absolute best. The combination of a relentless rush by all-pro tackle Bob Lilly, number 74, and the steady running of Don Perkins paced Dallas to a well-earned victory. For Coach Collier, a heartbreaking loss. For Tom Landry, a big step toward his first Eastern title. Defeat comes as a stranger to the Cleveland Browns, for they are the most successful franchise in pro football. They have a tradition that generates an all-out hustling spirit. A 
a tradition upheld by fiery competitors who put that something extra into every play. The Browns play the game with seasoned professionals. Men who play with the small hurts. Men who have the poise to handle almost any situation. This is a team with the winning habit, the winning spirit. You see it on the field. Feel it on the bench. Or you can be part of it in the stands. The last place New York Giants visited Municipal Stadium with hopes of starting their own winning tradition. At first, it looked as though the game would become a red-faced rout, an embarrassment no one thought possible. Gary Wood paced the New Yorkers to a 40-28 lead. With five minutes to play, the Giants kicked off. Leroy Kelly busted up the middle and over the icy turf for 50 yards. Ryan, Kelly, and Collins teamed up in a pass and lateral play that carried to the Giants' 20. Ryan singled out Catfish Smith for a touchdown, and the Giant lead was cut to five. Moments later, after a short New York punt, Cleveland regained the ball. The Giants watched in horror as Ernie Green slipped through their entire defense to go 31 yards for a touchdown, and Cleveland gained the lead for the first time in the game. With 40 seconds to play, the Browns' defense suddenly became the best offense. Bill Glass scooped up a New York fumble. Jim Kanicki, number 69, pushed the last bit of giant resistance right off the field, and Bill stepped in for the final score. The last game with the St. Louis Cardinals provided a fitting end to another successful Cleveland campaign. Frank Ryan was at his blazing best, throwing four touchdown passes. This was the Cleveland air attack at peak efficiency. A solid shot to Warfield set up a Ryan the Collins touchdown bomb. Right then and there, school was out for the Cardinals of St. Louis. Ryan solved the deadly Cardinal blitz and riddled the secondary with sharp, precise passes. In the fourth quarter, Green hauled in a short toss to up the Brown lead to 31 to 10. 
A touchdown grab by Clifton McNeil brought down the curtain on 1966. Another season, another string of victories, another chapter to add to pro football's most famous success story, the Cleveland Browns.